Good afternoon. It's 4 o'clock, and I'd like to call the Forsyth County Board of Education meeting to order. It's September the 11th. And at this time, I would like to welcome everybody and ask Kristen to lead us in the invocation and pledge, please. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Father, today we remember the thousands of innocent lives that were lost on the unforgettable morning of September 11th, 2001. We also salute those courageous first responders and heroic citizens who put themselves before others in order to save the lives of those they did not even know. We ask for grace for those hurting heroes and their families. We ask for peace amongst nations, and on this day of remembrance, lift up our hearts and bring us peace as well. Amen. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Many of you know that Liberty was uh, Liberty Middle School was opened and named in honor of um, September 11th and the horrible tragedy that happened that day. And today they had a ceremony that was just so well done. And it was interesting to note that the SRO who was there was from New York and lived in Manhattan and was um, involved in seeing all the tragedy that was there and helping afterwards with some of the people so he was very emotional as he talked about his experience there for the kids and then um, I think it's Lieutenant Colonel Mr. Uh, Tom Burgess spoke and we um, went through every plane and what happened through that and those ch those kids you could have heard a pin drop they did a dramatic presentation that was so good and a, a student played taps at the end. It was an extremely emotional, very well done presentation. So I wanted to commend um, those students and the faculty for what they did. Um, at this time, we, the board will look at the agenda and see if, if you can make a motion to approve. So moved. Second. second. Motion from Nancy, second from Tom. All in favor? Our first presentation will be on dual language. Update with Fonda Harrison. And others. And, and others. others. All the superstars. Yep. We've been given strict instructions. <laughs> no more than 10 minutes. <laughs> in one language? Oh, this is in one language. In, in one language. No. It's one okay. language. We need to say it here in two. So I'm just, I'm going to start off by doing a brief overview, just as a reminder for all of you about the program that we actually are implementing here in Forsyth County Schools. Um, first of all, DLI, um, it's a form of education where students are taught content and literacy um, in two languages. We actually have both of these programs occurring in Forsyth County Schools. One way emerging is occurring at Kelly Mill Elementary because of the demographics there. They're primarily uh, native English speakers. Some may have other language, um, but primarily English speakers. And then our two-way immersion is occurring at Brandywine and Cumming because they have native Spanish speakers as a part of their population too. And we're really excited that we're able to have both ways. <coughs> if in the future we expand this program, we will have schools that will be on the way side um, uh, and also the two-way so we're excited about with our first pilot year being able to offer both of those um, obviously the goals as we talked about last year um, proficiency in English um, proficiency in a new language for those um, that are not dual language currently um, academic achievement obviously not at the very beginning it takes a few years because they're learning math content in Spanish so you know that academic achievement we'll see later and then obviously the intercultural competence um, that those <coughs> students are being exposed to in their classrooms and then the 50 50 model there are several models out there this is the model that we chose to use in Forsyth County because research shows this is a very effective model so we have those two teachers a team of teachers at the kindergarten level in each school and um, they have approximately 25 students in each class. And those 25 students in each class at Brandywine and Cumming are for the most part 50-50 English-Spanish, 50-50 English-Spanish. Um, and then at Kelly Mill, obviously, primarily English in both of those classes. But the teacher then, one is a, the Spanish-speaking teach, teacher and the other is the English-speaking teacher in all three schools. Um, that's pretty much um, what we have there um, for those those parts. Um, also in the um, 
Spanish speaking teachers classroom, that Parapro is also a native Spanish speaking person. So that inside that classroom, it is strictly Spanish mm -hmm. that is spoken. And that's the interesting thing to go into the classrooms for all of us as we visited. It's like, we pretty much have to be quiet unless we use the little <laughs> bit of Spanish that we know of, you know, hasta mañana or buenos dias or the little bit that we know. Um, obviously, like I said, the students in the classroom are half um, English speaking and half um, heritage speaking, which in this case is Spanish. And um, then they spend half of their day in the English classroom and then they rotate and spend the other half of the day in the Spanish classroom with specific content being taught in each of those classrooms. And as I said before, the strict separation of languages. English in the English class as much as possible. When those Spanish speaking students obviously go into their English speaking classroom, they're still learning English themselves. But as far as the Spanish speaking classroom, everybody speaks Spanish. Okay, now each of our principals is gonna give a quick update um, of the program at their schools. Ron? Do the kids switch classrooms? Yes. Yes. Good afternoon. I first want to speak on behalf of um, the three of us to say thank you to the board for your support of this initiative and to the superintendent for the support. Uh, we've seen a lot of positives across all three schools, uh, one of which at Kelly Mill we've seen is a broadened cultural awareness, not just in the target language of Spanish, but for example, we have our morning news broadcast, which is run entirely by kids. Uh, this week we are delivering the news in Greek. Last week a, a student delivered them uh, in Russian and the weeks before a student delivered in Spanish. So wow. we have uh, lots of languages represented yeah, yeah. and it's been really cool to see literally their faces light up when they are acknowledged and recognized. Uh, we've had broad parent support. Our teachers who uh, for us have experience as a DLI teacher. So in fact, the, both of my teachers in the English um, classroom and the Spanish classroom have taught together before in a previous district as partner DLI. So we were fortunate to, to kind of get that started that way. But um, it's been a great thing, and I would definitely do it again. Coming has been a fabulous adventure as well. I think when we started, um, you know, we have crying in kindergarten usually, and so I was worried we'd have even more when we're speaking Spanish half the day, and we did not. Mm -hmm. And it's it's been amazing to see how much the community has embraced, how much my staff has embraced this when the classes are walking down the hall. Teachers are trying to learn more and more Spanish so they can speak mm -hmm. to the students and the teachers in the hallway. Our Spanish-speaking teacher in Para will only speak in Spanish no matter where they are in the building. Um, so that's been really fun. Um, a couple of things that we've noticed that I've been thrilled about are parent volunteerism has skyrocketed this year. And I think a big part of that was how many meetings we held last year with our new kindergarten families to introduce them to this concept. And I think our parents have felt very welcomed and felt like when mm -hmm. day one started, they're already a part of our school. And so we've seen at um, our PTO meetings and our parent volunteer room parent meetings, so many parents that are coming specifically from these two DLI classrooms, which That's has been great. very exciting. Um, I'm also excited, and I think um, Ron and Todd are in a similar situation, but we've already hired, at least I have it coming, my teachers for next year. Oh, and wow. so they're already in place in my building now. Uh, Brittany Green, the two teachers in the top right corner are next year's DLI teachers. Um, Brittany was an ESOL teacher in Fulton County, and she's teaching first grade for me. So she's already learning the first grade curriculum. She's making relationships with those first grade teachers. And then Marcella Mazurkowitz is from Costa Rica, and she is uh, one of our Title I teachers now, but she's providing support in Spanish to our Spanish-speaking classroom um, in the math class. So she's already, these will be her children next year. She's already building relationships with them. She sees how Jessica McNeely, the Spanish-speaking teacher, has set everything up. Um, so it's kind of that on-the-job training to get her ready for next year. And our hope is, as we're going to the job fairs this year, 
that we can stay a year ahead and then for next year hopefully hire our second grade teachers that we can go ahead and get in place and give them the opportunity to, to get to know our school, our curriculum, build relationships so we can walk right in the door with it. I think um, the thing I've been most excited about though is watching the students and their confidence levels are incredible. And I expected this in our Spanish speaking population to see normally students who are coming into a, an English dominant <coughs> area that don't always understand the language. You're coming in as kindergartners. It can be scary in itself, and so they're, they're very reticent and quiet. They have been arms up, talking, you know, so involved. But our English-speaking students in the Spanish classroom have been incredible. And I've gone in and tried to <laughs> stay along. I took German and Latin in high school, so it's not really helping me out very much. But the um, children have learned so quickly. And I've had several parents tell me that their children have come home to say, I'm the best Spanish speaker in the class, <laughs> even though they might know Buenos Dias and a couple <laughs> other words. But it's been so much fun to watch both our native English speakers and our native Spanish speakers exist exude that confidence and excitement, and I think it's spreading through our teachers, through our staff, and through our parents. That's great. Thanks. So just to follow up on what uh, Leanne had shared, uh, we said this before, just kudos to you all in our district office for allowing us to have a year to prepare. Um, the, hot, the teachers we have in place for next year, again, the district uh, has been gracious to say y'all could send those teachers to any of the trainings that we're doing for the current kindergarten teachers which again is going to set them up for success for next year as well so uh, thank you for all of that um, as far as students adjusting well to the transition again I think Leanne mentioned this a little bit that you typically have kindergartners who already are uh, nervous about school uh, they come the first two days and then Monday comes again you mean I got to go back there <laughs> and of course they don't want to come anymore but imagine the kids that um, are in a Spanish speaking room that only know English they have no idea what's happening and they're just looking around and not even sure uh, what to do so uh, but the transition's been great uh, for us we were fortunate to have a waiting list at Brandywine uh, we did end up going into our waiting list um, for uh, some reasons uh, that before school started, we had a couple of families that dropped out. Just I think once they realized the commitment, they had dropped out, which then allowed us to go onto our waiting list. So uh, uh, those parents were obviously thrilled. Um, it's, it's a great thing to have, but it's also a bad thing to have as well because you feel bad that those parents that did not get in um, couldn't partake in the um, DLI. So uh, we're working through that, but it's exciting, and I think it's just going to get uh, larger next year now that people know about it. It's really going to grow, so that's exciting. Um, we are going to have in the near future, um, probably before the end of September, a DLI day just for the families. Um, of course, they've gone to curriculum night or come to curriculum night, but they don't always know what that looks like in the classroom. So we're gonna invite them for blocks of time to where they can actually sit in there and watch what the teacher's doing. Um, there's not necessarily a lot of homework going home, obviously it's kindergarten, but uh, they don't always see the end result of what they're doing during the day. So we're gonna actually have those parents in so again they can watch and see what their uh, kids are doing. So overall, it's been a great start. Uh, a lot of work for the teachers. They are putting in an extreme amount of time, and they knew that, but they love it, and it's going very well. So uh, we know that uh, the video we're going to show, that's what you all want to see. So <laughs> one thing I would say to pay attention to is watch the native Spanish speakers and their confidence like Leanne had shared. Mm -hmm. It's almost flipped to where the students that don't speak Spanish in the classroom that they're in, you can see them doing this. <laughs> and our Spanish-speaking students almost are taking the lead, like, I know what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool to see. So the video, I think, is about four minutes. Yeah, and I think they have it on the screen. You can stop it, too, if you need to for time. This is a magic room. 
out here and speak English. But when I walk in this door, puedo hablar y entender español. language immersion it's one of the programs that we have but uh, we make sure that it's equitable for anybody that is interested mm -hmm. in the program but we might see that it might not be a fit you know for mm -hmm. a particular child but we exhaust all you know the regular uh, procedures and means that we have in order to support mm -hmm. them as much as we can and then okay. if you know if for some reason that it's really not a good fit then mm -hmm. that is something that we'll, we would address in an, in, in, on an individual basis okay. absolutely mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I just want to thank you one more time too because I think this is an amazing program and I think you know we have seen already that uh, what an impact it, it has made especially in our Spanish speaking community right. and um, and I think it will be a, a huge um, benefit for our uh, English native speaking community too because they will um, gain proficiency to a level 
that we have not seen before in any other world language classroom. So mm -hmm. for that, this is going to be an amazing benefit for both populations, mm -hmm. and we like that. One of the things that we've really learned um, through this year, we were so fortunate to really prepare well a year and a half in advance, and. Um, and it's absolutely amazing, you know, all the principals and all the administrators that have really um, and religiously have worked uh, on a monthly basis to make sure that we uh, review all the research, that we discuss any uh, implementation, that we discuss, you know, what are potential obstacles. And so we've had a lot of um, um, really planning that went into that. But now that we've started it, what we're seeing is that we need to make sure that we keep that professional development going. Um, especially with the teachers. The teachers are absolutely amazing. They are very eager, very enthusiastic, and we meet with them on a very regular basis um, to make sure that we're implementing with fidelity. Uh, but we do see that they need that support and um, that we need to continue with that professional development. And they come, and they are so enthusiastic, they come with very, very high level questions on how can I do this, how can I serve my students even more, and how can I serve them even better. So we just find that that professional development piece is very crucial for the implementation for dual language immersion. And as we're growing one level, one year at a time, you would see that that is something that we would have to repeat with all the new teachers that we're bringing on board. Um, as we're working together <coughs> with all the other teachers, you know, that are part of the program. But hopefully we can count on them then also, you know, to uh, become the teacher leaders and, and help us with the implementation mm -hmm. and the professional development of any uh, new mm -hmm. coming teacher. Um, so we have a lot of things that we have planned for this year. We're contra uh, contracting with a consultant to make sure that we're implementing with fidelity. We're also um, encouraging our teachers and our administrators to go to conferences. Um, and we also are hosting, actually, this Saturday at Kelly Mill Elementary a um, very short mini-conference hosted by um, the Georgia Department of Education um, and uh, where we're really um, providing some uh, professional development for teachers, for administrators, and for anybody that is new to dual language immersion and that want, uh, wants to, you know, anybody who wants to learn something about dual language immersion. So we have a lot planned for that and we continue to do that, you know, in the future. And then the last thing is, uh, this is the DLI in a day mini conference. So we had a planning meeting with um, um, the representative from the Department of Education. So we will host probably 100, we, I think we have 120 registrants right now for the conference. Um, and hopefully we'll find our new, new teachers there already. So hopefully we can <laughs> 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 um, and we just want to thank you because without you, without your vision and um, your guidance, this would have not been possible. And uh, I think it's an amazing program. We hope that you will find the time to come out and visit the classrooms. I know the teachers are really mm, we'd love to. and the administrators yeah. to welcome you at the yeah, school yeah. and um, really okay. test and look at what Forward wonderful things it. are happening at the school. Okay. Thank you. For um, how did uh, how did you, I mean, yours is different from the others. Yeah. So did you also have a waiting list or people now that want to do it after they see how it works? Or? Yes, we um, readily filled up to capacity and we have about three on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of positive conversations about next year's group. And we're in this, we've had the same conversations, parents wanting their child retained in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes, into the program. So it's, it's quite an interesting um, domino effect once this has been implemented. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the administrators have found it a little unique trying to do in class uh, TEAK <laughs> observations, <laughs> right? <laughs> How do you That's do why that? Working so closely together. <laughs> uh, sure, right. And actually, about um, that. Yeah. we shared an instrument for them, you know, when they go on the Spanish side, what to look for and mm -hmm. what are some things, you know, that they should be observing in the classroom. Very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have yeah. a bilingual assistant principal, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really smart. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's, that's, that's great. Uh, what is the sense? Like in Cobb County, they have one of the 
ongoing programs there that the the kids stay in the program from year to year? Are they seeing that? Are they seeing several drop out? Do they know? Um, Tell them. So usually, and what the research shows to you, and that is also the case in Cobb County, is that a lot of them stay in the program. Mm -hmm. um, they are so supportive that actually attendance rates and um, program attendance rate in general is higher than in, in a regular wow. classroom. And so uh, in Cobb County, in Gwinnett County, in, in Atlanta Public Schools, they have really seen um, great retention rates. And it's usually the kid that is moving away because of mm -hmm. work or employment. And, and mm -hmm. those are usually the reasons why somebody mm -hmm. would drop out. But we also are getting a lot of calls from all over the nation and asking, while well, we hear that you have dual language immersion, we're coming from a dual language immersion program. Can we be, oh, part, can of we be part of that program? So oh, we're wow. starting in oh. kindergarten, so we're you know still limited on the grade levels that we can serve. But that right. will be something that's you know, coming. That we're oh, serving, boy. serving our community too. Wow. Another reason to bring well, thank you for out. thank you for getting thank it started. Yeah, Anybody else have any comments? Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you yeah. very much. It's very powerful. All right, next we will have a report on homeless policy revision update with Kim Bolivar. Hi, how Hello. are you? Hi. I've got some papers for you. <coughs> and let's go ahead and pull this up. Well, thanks for your time, I appreciate it. I wanted to give you updates on the homeless education policy. Because ESSA changed, and a lot changed in McKinney-Vento under ESSA. We've had a couple of different revisions and approvals that have already happened. Uh, back in December, uh, January of 2017, we had our initial review where we had to change some wording in the laws just because of the ESSA updates. Uh, last fall, we were given guidance to the State Homeless Liaison Conference that there is a sixth requirement, which is credit accrual. Spoke with Joy Perkle, got guidance from our state people, and they said it would be fine to do a procedure change. Later on that year, we were told that we really need to have a policy change in addition to that procedure change for credit accrual and specifics of that. So you have before you uh, the outline for our homeless policy education update. First of all, as we stated, we had the ESSA updates initially made January 20th of 2017. Then we had the procedure updates on the 19th of 2018. And here we are again with a reinterpretation of the law. Because what we were told when it first comes out, we have the basic understanding. Three years down the line, we have the fine nitty gritty points that we need to get to. And now we're getting to nuances in vocabulary. The biggest initial change that happened was that foster care became its own separate program. And so now we have a foster care program that's funded thanks to Amy Chang under Title I with an MV set aside, with a Title I set aside, and we're able to provide tutoring, which is amazing. We're one of the only districts in the state that have that. And the other districts are like, why do you have that? <laughs> like, because nice. Ms. Chang is amazing. Um, <laughs> but the updates that you see today reflect um, guidance from Eric McGee, our contact with the state, as well as Harbin, Hartley, and Hawkins. And they reflect the guidance that's given by Godot. All right. So you have on the second page of the attachment that I gave you the current policy. And then, hmm, let's go back, okay. So you have the very first page, let's see. Oh, no, if you look at your packet, because the slicer is not matching right here, this is the current policy. If you'll flip the page, you'll see the proposed changes. And this is direct guidance. The very first change that you'll see is the original policy had specific wording about the year that McKinney-Vento was authorized and reauthorized. Now they're recommending that we be, be very vaguely specific and we just say under the McKinney-Vento Act. In addition to that, we have some other changes. Um, and they're vaguely specific and some are very specific. And I'm gonna get into those. If you look, after the very first point, in accordance with the act, every child, it's vaguely specific. And then it talks about immediate enrollment. Okay, that hasn't changed much. The superintendent appointing someone hasn't changed much. When we get into that middle thicker paragraph, that's where we get into some of the vocabulary changes. You'll notice the word stigmatize or segregate. Um, that's new vocabulary that has been recommended to put in and it's under the ESSA updates. We also have some nuanced wording. Um, we've changed vocational to career and technical education and special education to students with disabilities. 
And then we come into credit recovery. And credit recovery is that sixth piece that we have to have under ESSA guidance. And that needs to be stated in policy now. Finally, we have specifics of what the superintendent and the homeless liaison are supposed to have um, for supports that include immunization, which thanks to the health department, we do have free vouchers for immunizations and for 3,300 forms for homeless education students, so it's not a fee to them. Um, birth certificates, transfer school records, we have a great relationship with student information systems. My office is right next door. We literally have revolving doors constantly mm -hmm. where families come in. And um, other documents required for uh, enrollment and we have immediate enrollment we don't investigate beforehand that is part of the law um, we go ahead and we let families in who are saying that they're MV and then I actually personally will do home visits or the social workers do will if we have any questions or if we need proof of residency for verification of enrollment and then finally the biggest change down here at the bottom and this is kind of a new one to us but again all that interpretation comes out by year three we need to make sure that we have that uh, dispute resolution process which our district had in place years ago and an opportunity for complaints and we have that posted in multiple areas on our website and then we can also give it to students. One of the things we've had, if we had any questions about whether or not a family was McKinney-Vento, we now are required to give them a dispute resolution process. Mm -hmm. um, if someone we feel is fraudulently enrolled and we're able to prove that under McKinney-Vento, there's a dispute resolution process that we fill out and we will mail and also email to the parents for them to complete within a certain amount of time under state and federal guidance. Do you see many stu uh, people trying to take advantage of this by nothing at no. all? Good. Our numbers are up significantly. That's I saw them. <laughs> it's, it's, it, our numbers are just up significantly, and statewide they're up. Wow. I spoke with um, our state representative, and it's a statewide problem, and it's not just indicative of us. And we did get refunded for our grant. All of our monies are down, but our numbers are up. <laughs> oh, wow. So it is what it is, and we're going to continue to work with all of our community agencies to support the families mm -hmm. and get immediate enrollment. And tutoring will be starting October 1st when grant funds load. Wow. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Approximately how many students? Can 333. Mm -hmm. And growing. Yeah. yeah. Every single day we're talking to new families, and we're also working with existing families. That have moved in that are homeless, or people that have lived here that have gotten in that situation, or is it a mix? I don't have a percentage of new versus existing. Some families are existing families who have a younger child who's enrolling, mm -hmm. but any family that's requalified typically is in that doubled up category, and they have moved again. Mm -hmm. And so it could be that they were doubled up for a year. We don't requalify them unless there's some very odd, extenuating circumstances. But many families who are doubled up, the welcome that wears out, and they'll move four to five times in a school year. And without McKinney Vento, they don't have school of origin. Mm -hmm. And when they transition from Chesapeake to Matt to Haw Creek <laughs> to Dave's Creek, they're getting a whole different teacher, a whole different oh, way of presenting information. Yeah. So school stability is so important. Mm -hmm. um, last year we had a student, and he's kind of my student that really, really sticks in my brain, and I'll probably talk about him for years to come. He was, should have been a 12th grader. He was 17 years old. He had five credits towards graduation. He came back to us last year. He had been with us back in first grade. His parents moved to 40 different counties. Now, there were other extenuating circumstances going on, but that credit accrual piece is so important for kids. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at creative ways, and we have a lot. We're so far ahead. I'm going to tell you right now. The state actually told us, you are really the exemplar. Yeah. Another specific wording in here, and there is one um, correction I need to have. There is a comma missing between the word transportation services and Head Start right here in the fifth little, pair, the fifth little guidance right here. I But Head Start is something that we've been requested for a couple of years under ESSA, and we're one of the few counties in the state where we could expand our early Learning program, I'm sure. We're one of the few counties in the state that have an existing collaboration. We've got a meeting scheduled with Head Start, Community Based Education, and Christy Quinn, Title I, Foster, and MB tomorrow just to make sure our processes and procedures are in place mm -hmm. and our practices are up to date. <coughs> but um, the state was like, yeah, we're going to call you because Forsyth County really has a lot of collaboration yeah. going on. So yeah. we've had a great foundation laid by predecessors and we're very thankful to just carry on. Do you have questions? Yeah. Concerns? Just so a comment. I mean, she pointed so out the work <laughs> of, of Amy, and rightfully so, but uh, the reason we are an exemplar is because of the person standing in front of us today. Mm -hmm. She does an outstanding mm -hmm. job with these students and has a passion for it, and Absolutely. we really appreciate what you do. It's an honor to serve. Thank you so Thank much. You. I appreciate you all. Take care. Mm -hmm.
She's like, I think that's what happens is they feel, they find that people like Kim do such a great job mm -hmm. that they're coming here. It's what happens with special needs and right. Title I. That they yeah, have what a heart we do. for this yes. work. Do. And, and we have a lot that. of collaboration between federal programs this year. That Not that this is part of this presentation, but a rise in special education crossing over to MB. And so we're seeing a lot of collaboration as our district grows, mm -hmm. they are going to be growing pains. Mm -hmm. And so change is a chance for us to look at ways to collaborate and connect mm -hmm. when we go through safety and security um, and students need to go to Gateway, when we go through our international transcripts, those are all ways that we are growing and expanding in our immediate enrollment. Mm -hmm. But it's true and we all are here to serve families and that's, mm -hmm. that's Dr. Bearden's challenge to keep a large district small. Good. So thank, thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you so thank you. much. It's very sobering. Mm -hmm. All right, next is legislative priorities with Jeff Gratchola. Good afternoon. Hello. We have a draft of legislative priorities before you and they'll come back to you next week for approval after we get some feedback. These priorities are a little bit different than what we've done in prior years. Mm -hmm. They're very specific. And also, too, Dr. Bearden worked with Metro Lisa superintendents to compile these. Um, we firmly believe that it is a state and local partnership, and you will see some of these priorities um, are talking about that additional partnership based on things that we've done at the local level. So the first um, challenge is keeping our students and teachers safe. And so what we're requesting is that the state partner with us to contribute to the funding for the seller benefits and training for one school resource officer per school in Georgia. I don't have to tell you about the success that we've had with our SRO programs, but this is something that we feel that should be a partnership with the state and not locally funded. The second ties straight into that, that is the student access to mental health services. Um, right now, the state funding is one to 450 students for our guidance counselors. They are crucial in changing this and assisting our students with mental health services. And the ASCA service, the ASCA model, as well as the, I always forget, National Association for College Admissions Counseling recommends one to 250. And so we're asking the state to partner with us. You have locally funded counseling positions, SEL positions, but we're asking the state to partner with us and invest in our school counselors. The third challenge is recruiting and retaining teachers. Right now, out of the states, we are ranked 38th for starting teacher salaries, um, which is $4,000 below the average. And you heard the presentation from Dr. Salem last month about how important that is to get our teachers in. And right now, we're competing with other, other industries, too, as well. So we're asking the state to increase their portion for the starting teacher salary. We do have that local supplement that we add in to make it more competitive, but we want the state to partner with us as well to get the very best educators in Georgia. And then challenge number four is the state and the local partnership. We had um, great success with fully funding the QBE this year. We would like the state to continue that. We also would like them to continue to provide greater flexibility, increase the capital outlay growth um, for our student enrollment, and then maintain the state tax base and the local control. And that last bullet, the um, last challenge kind of pulls in many things that you guys have discussed over the years with our, st with our state legislators. So we wanted to continue to add that in there so they know that those are things that are important to us, especially fully funding QBE. Mm -hmm. So those are our four um, challenges that we would like to present towards the um, state delegation. And of course, this is just a recap of our highlights for the year. Okay. So what, what we wanted to do is put it out in the work session in September, give you a chance to comment, see if there's anything you wanted to add or any amendment to uh, what Jennifer presented. Uh, then we would ask for you to vote on it next week, uh, send it out to our delegation. We will still meet with them in November as we always do, but one of our representatives uh, requested this information earlier on uh, as they have meetings in preparation for the session and that made sense to me. Mm -hmm. So at this point, if you have any amendments, changes, recommendations for further, this would be the time to discuss it. I just want to say I like that it's more specific, mm -hmm. and I think that's what our delegation was looking for last year. They, they wanted to help us, and we have general things that we have all the time, so this is so much more specific, I think it's going to be, and I like the fact that you went with Risa and talked to other systems that were being consistent in our message. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we talked to them, and, the, and I had gone to the large district meeting as a follow-up to what Jeff had done, and everybody had different viewpoints of every point that we brought up. But they did want them consolidated. They never decided who would consolidate them. At one, at one point, I would guess G GSBA, so that maybe there is some consistency across the board, and especially the large districts, mm -hmm. about these issues. Uh, there was some question about salaries, how that would also add the cost of benefits and things like that. But the T beginning teacher salary is something that would help every district in Georgia, mm -hmm. every district, and I think it's something that they have to realize that yes, education takes the majority of the tax dollars and funding, but it's also the basis of the success of everything we do, and it's time that there's more money put towards education, even though we get a good chunk already, but, um, and that's a good place to start, so. Anybody else? All right. Okay. So okay. we'll vote on it next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next is a discussion we are going to have on a resolution that Kristen wanted to talk about to support impact fees. So Kristen. All right. What I think I would do is start with a, a little bit of background, um, explain why this topic has come up again, and then get into some of the reasons why I feel um, strongly about the implementation of school impact fees. As a refresher, Georgia law currently allows impact fees at individual counties, but they do not allow them for schools. Forsyth County has implemented impact fees for road improvements, for parks, for libraries, and public safeties. But again, not schools because it's not allowed at the state level. So the whole point of this discussion is to encourage our delegation and other members of the State Assembly to change the Georgia Constitution to allow individual counties, municipalities to vote and decide whether they choose to have impact fees for schools or not. It's just a matter of local control across the board. Um, we did attempt, a, we did a resolution, a unanimous one in 2015. Darla and myself went down and spoke before the Senate Finance Committee. There was a bill that was um, put aside there and I think we had a good conversation with the Senate Finance Committee. I think we presented Forsyth County data showing how well we spend our f the funds that we do get, that we're fiscally responsible and we're also very high succeeding. Um, I think they were actually impressed with that. But in the end, the bill did not, they didn't get out of committee, it did therefore fa fail. Um, one of the comments that was made at the meeting was, well, Forsyth County's millage rate is 17.3. And if the maximum is 20 mills, then you just need to raise your taxes. Um, and we didn't feel that that was, <laughs> and it also didn't take an effect that we have a millage rate 2.418 for our bonds. So when you add that, it puts us almost to the 20 mm -hmm. max anyway. So, um, so it did not get out of committee. Um, and there's been a lot of changes since then. Um, we didn't really do anything with the last couple of years. There was other big, bigger things going to the state. There's OSD. There was getting the QBE fully funded. There was a lot of elections that would have played into the politics of this. So things have changed. And so this year, our current delegation, some new members, I think it's a worth, tr worth trying again. They also are looking at perhaps writing a bill that might be different than before. Perhaps it would be tailored toward high growth systems like Forsyth County and not s s statewide. That might make it more palatable because some counties don't feel that they want this. But again, all we're asking for is the right to have individual counties choose to do it. So if a county chooses not to, have at it. It's just an option, option for local control. So who would, who would decide if, if we chose to? First, the General Assembly vote, would change. the voters? Or? Yeah, they would have to vote and make a change to the Constitution allowing the counties. And then the voters would make a decision. And then the county and our staff, whomever, would work on a way to figure out the exact amount of fee, which is a very compli compli complicated process because remembering impact fees are just meant to offset the impact of a new growth, new building in the county. It's not meant to fix pre-existing situations. So it's not a wealth of money. It's not a huge influx. It's so it has to be very calculated that the number is realistic in its use. It's not meant, it's not pulled out of the air. But so it would go out to, for a public vote to decide. I if believe so, yes. And then if we did have it. Yeah, and then it would, the actual number would be for, just to get an idea, in Forsyth County, of the men, things I mentioned, parks, roads, libraries, and public safety, for a single family home, the current fee is $3,804. And that's against residential development. It is not charged for commercial development coming in. 
the only thing a, co a commercial development would pay is for public safety, of course, because you, you wouldn't want to have impact fees for schools, for, for businesses. We want to attract businesses. We don't want to scare them away. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's very, it varies. Roads is roughly $2,000. For parks, it's $1,100. Libraries, it's 150 And public safety, it's 510 So you can see the number is tailored to the need. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very specific. So let me go on. And that's no matter what the value of the house? It's per unit. The county recently changed unit. it, yeah, but it is per unit. And it br it's broken down single family detached, multi family, mobile home, RV, retail office. I, so it's broken down by what it is. They went through a big process updating it and revising their numbers over the last couple of years. Went through a lot of public comment. All right, um, let me just see. So, some of the reasons why I personally am in favor of it. Um, Impact fees are just one of many things that could be used to, to fix our funding problems. No one thing is going to fix it, and again, it's not a large amount of money that would, would come in, but it would help. It, it's our job as board members to look out to, out to alternative funding, and I think this is one way we can inc increase our funding for capital needs without having to raise our ad valorem taxes. Impact fees, when combined with other capital revenues like SPLOS and bond, bond dollars and M&O, can actually make a project come in faster. For example, the library we used, um, we built, we just did a res renovation of the Sharon Forks Library that cost $7.2 million. We were able to get a $2 million state grant because we were able to use $2.4 million in impact fees in addition to SPLOS funds for the grand total of $7.2 million. So we were able to get that state grant because we showed that we had local dollars to put towards it. Mm -hmm. So not only did it create more funds, but it meant putting it together made a project happen that might not otherwise and even better sooner. Mm -hmm. So it's to me it's a combination of funds and showing that you have skin in the game when you have more funds. Um, I've also over the years, this has been going on talking about since that I remember since 2013-12 and I know Tom said he's been following it even longer than that. When I've spoken to different developers and attorneys in, in the industry, they've actually were in favor of this to my surprise at first because when they go to do a zoning and they're bringing in a subdivision of 100 homes, they're going to get a lot of pushback in the community because of the impact on the schools. Mm -hmm. But if they can go there and say, okay, well, if I have to pay an impact fee per house, I'm going to help, help offset the impact of my subdivision, which helps them process their application faster and hopefully that's what the community has been asking for, for them to pay their part. I think we all know that people are attracted for Forsyth County for a variety of reasons, schools, libraries, parks, safety, but one of the reasons people come here is because of the quality of the schools. And when you buy a home in a subdivision, for example, whether it's new or existing, most of the time you pay an initiation fee for the amenities that are there so that they can be built or because you were attracted because they had great tennis courts or whatever. So you'll pay $500, $1,000 or more to just to be in that subdivision. So if you move to Forsyth County because you want to be in our high quality schools, then I think I know I would have been willing to pay whatever the amount was, say $500 or whatever, to go into our schools. They're bringing an impact right away. State law requires that when they move here, we have a place for them, whether it's a trailer or it's a school, we have to have a teacher, we have to be ready to go. But we're not required to build a new library or a new park. I mean, you all know how passionate I am about those. Right. But how can we have impact fees for libraries and parks but not have them for schools, which we are constitutionally mandated to have right away? So um, I also like the transparency of impact fees. Our budget is so big, and it's very complicated, and building and buying schools is a long process. When you have impact fees, there's a time period from the time it's collected to the time that you have to expend it. And when you do, for example, we spent seven hundred and some odd thousand dollars on some property for a new library. It's right. You can go back and say, "Oh, 2017. There it is. It's a simple Google search. Boom, it's right there." And then if we get three or four years in and we haven't spent the money, that money has to go back. So the transparency is just so obvious there with impact fees. I just, I really enjoy is, that part of it. Are they mandated that they're spent on specific things? It has to be in capital in capital expenditures. Yes. Does it have to be in the area <coughs> excuse me, of the high growth, or can it be wherever in the county that the need is? It used to be a few years back in the district that it was. It was okay. like north and south, but the commissioners recently voted to make it more of a countywide thing. So it would be hard to keep track of, I would think. So yeah, that's their impact fees, but would we decide how the school impact fees would be? That's a really good how question. Would we, how we would use them? Mm -hmm. I don't know that. That's a really I good question. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
There's pros and I mean, cons I would to think that just because the commissioners do it one way with the library impact, they wouldn't mean that we would have to do it that way with the school. I mean, I don't know. There is pros and cons. When the county was building, being built out heavily in the, in the south end, a lot of the impact fees went down there. And to me, by definition, that's how it's supposed to be. It's meant to offset the impact down there. Now that the county's been built out a little bit more, the money's being starting to be spent farther north. There's opinions, varying some opinions on that. Um, I see pros and cons, but eventually you do have to start building and replacing things where the growth goes. So mm -hmm. there I is. I think just by the nature of them, that's what would happen yeah. in our world, because so. we're going to build it where the need is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's all about capital. I mean, we saw the expense, the M&O part, you know, when we had our, quote, tax increase this year, um, it was due to the growth. So you can almost calculate the cost of a student times the number of, you know, the amount of money over in the digest this year and attribute that to the growth. So the, the, the maintenance and operation costs are handled by the increase in the tax base. The, the, the facilities are the hard part that we have to go build and we have to wait. So we have this trauma of putting trailers and then building schools and waiting long enough and it always costs us out of our budget and we have to find money for that. So these kind of expenses are covered by that. I've looked at other organizations. If you look back at DeKalb over the history, and we can learn from the wisdom that was there, a lot of the builders used to donate land to a school, yes. and they'd build neighborhood schools, right. and now they're failing, having to be closed, having to bus kids into neighborhoods where it's an older neighborhood now. So that wasn't a great model, and when I came up here to Forsyth, that's one of the things I noticed I didn't want to see happen. Uh, and I started watching the impact fees in the county world and wondering why didn't the schools get them too. So as a public member, I was thinking the same thing. So it kind of makes sense. And with our focus and one of our goals being to seek alternative you know, funding sources, this seems to be a logical conclusion of where we go get that capital money to make those improvements to help support the growth because we don't have our high growth um, capital outlay anymore it's gone right. so we've lost some of the the places we used to get some of that money and now we're just looking for those other sources so that's really what it makes common sense to me uh, and I'd love to hear anybody else mm -hmm. just no, I, and everything sounds very logical to me I, I guess I'm just one that I just don't like impact fees I just think they're another tax it just increases the value of each home and I think that, that uh, as edu the education budget, the amount of the taxes we pay is majority education funds. And I, I just think as asking people after the fact, after we've had all this growth and people have been here and we've used all the facilities and had to build the schools and then now certainly we're changing and anybody else who moves into the county has to have this additional tax is the way I look at it onto their home. And it's just a philosophical difference, and um, I, th I hear the logic that you all are saying, but I just really don't believe in impact fees at all. So that's just yeah, and I, I agree with you to a point. You know, anytime we're taxing somebody, that's where we get the money to, to do what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of in a place of it makes more sense from a capital perspective, not from the M&O. Yeah, and, and this really stems out of the fact that we're out of balance and that we have a high residential tax mm -hmm. base. Right. If we were to increase our business tax base, this may not be as much of an issue because now through SPLOST and other means, we're going to get that increase that we need because of the increased spending, because of the num you know, increased number mm -hmm. of people in the mm -hmm. community. So, you know, we can fix it other ways too. The other worry I have is that this is going to add additional cost to housing as it is, especially when you start doing impact fees on apartment complexes, because that's per unit too, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it's so expensive now, even to find an apartment, it's not going to help housing for younger people. Yeah. And that, this is just adding on to that. So I, that's another I reason. I that but, and I, I, I can see your point in that, but the thing is the cost is not going to go away. So apartments is a great example. There are there's some zonings in now that are going to bring three and four and five hundred apartments over a two to three year period, mm -hmm. and we have to have a place to put those kids. So why should they not help pay for the costs? Why should we just continue to spread out the funds that we have that we can't put towards teacher salaries or? If these funds just go for capital needs, it might free up a little bit of money out of our M&O to pay for the small things that we are either financing on a bond 
or the things that we get on our LLC letters that we say, oh, we, we'd love to fix that mm -hmm. for you. We'd love to add parking at your school because there's not enough for the parents to come on parent night, but we can't because we don't quite have the money yet. Mm -hmm. So if we could use the, these funds for the true growth and then use our other funds for teachers or equipment or whatever needs to be fixed, it just seems to make sense to me. It's a one-time fee. It's not a continuing tax. No, but it, it is in a way that it's added to the cost of the building. I mean, whoever buys that house has that. So it they're can. paying tax on the tax on that. So okay, I understand. It's a, it's a little bit nitpicky, but. but if I'll pay 500, if I pay $1,000 to be in a place of tennis courts, I'll, I'll pay any amount to go, half that to, go to, a, to go to a school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nancy, what are your thoughts? I think so. I, like she was just saying, if you're paying $500 for the libraries or for the tennis courts in a subdivision, you're the one that decides where you're going to live and where you're going to move to. So I think um, I see it as just logical also, like Tom said, that if you're moving in, especially with, with the high growth still coming, I mean, we, we, we've kind of taken care of where we are right now, but we see ourselves, we got behind the eight ball when, they, when the recession went down. You know, we're just trying to catch up right now. And I see it as a way of, of catching up a little bit. And so the, if the costs go up a little bit higher, maybe that will actually slow our growth a little bit, which would help us. Then we won't be doing it. But I feel at least having the opportunity for the community to say yes or no, I, to me, just seems logical that at least we give them the opportunity. Kristen, what was the original reason it was never, schools were not included? I think it's your actually. I think Tim Emerson, actually, I don't hate to put you on the spot. I know it's a more complicated topic. Other states, I actually get, get into reading. There are other states that have it, but it's hard, it is a little hard to compare because education funding from state mm -hmm. to state varies very much. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to be careful when you're double taxing and things on SPLOS. So I think it has to be done carefully, and it is complicated, but um, I think it's worth researching and at least taking it to a local control. Let the state mm -hmm. allow us to decide, and if the mm -hmm. county decides not to, then have at it. We've at least done our part to explore it. Okay. Darla, what's so. your thoughts on it? I agree with Nancy. I mean, I think that we should at least be able to decide. Okay. And, mm -hmm. you know, as bad as I hate it, because I have kids that can't afford right, to live can't here. Afford to live here. Oh, that is no, I understand that, but yeah, that argument, yeah. But Everybody I think you can wants take to into live account. here because of the schools, that's right. right. And, and it's not, like you say, it's a one-time fee. It's one not a fee. every year. But I do see in the last paragraph that we have the South County delegation to the 2016. Yeah, we, 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 we just yeah. we just shared the the previous draft, so we'll we'll update the date Thanks. on that and bring it back to the board for uh, a vote next next okay. Tuesday night. Yeah. Okay. We'll get that changed. I guess yeah. I asked you that question, but and what kind of pushback you think that the legislators will get if you present it in that letting counties decide on their own. Because I, I can't imagine, listening to your logic, why they would have ever left schools out to begin with. The, the reason that it didn't, one of the biggest pushbacks was two things. When we were at the meetings, there was, there was lobbyists that were sitting next to us and had obviously had worked to get this killed from the get-go. But one of the biggest reasons we heard was small counties, slow-growth counties, would do anything to have our problems. Yeah what it boiled mm -hmm. down to yeah. and um, so it was almost like a thing where we are not sympathetic to you yeah mm -hmm. i mean it was like mm -hmm. the military rates 20 come back and see us pretty mm -hmm. much it is and when we started the meeting they were very like whatever you're for scythe county but then when we started to go through our accolades and say look we have the lowest millage rate we have the highest graduation sat act when we listed all that like oh so it, we have a good rate of return on our investment mm -hmm. but we're doing everything we could and then they kind of softened and then it was actually one of the members of our delegation who made that comment about us being able to raise our millage rate, which, again, a millage rate is an important number, but if you have a millage rate of 17.3 in Forsyth County, and then you have 17.3 in a rural county, that is not gonna bring in the same revenue. No. no. So the millage rate is an important thing that it's low, but you have to multiply it out and see what you're really paying as a taxpayer, so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's mm -hmm. kind of what it was. So, again, if this was passed and allowed individual counties, if you don't want to do it because you're a slow growth county and you want it, have at it, don't do right. it. Right. I just don't think that we, all of us, we just didn't present it as well as we could have. It was, this gives us time. Here we are in September. We can learn more, get more questions answered, and, you know, they've got through April to make this decision. So, well, the articles I read said it was more negative in an urban area than a suburban, which we are, mm -hmm. because 
you want to attract people to live downtown first and all of the infrastructure is already there in place so you're not really building any new built facilities which is what this is addressing yeah well we certainly have the growth okay mm -hmm. thank all right. you thank you all righty so that will be on the agenda next week next week right all right, all right next is um school calendar and the discussion is in relationship to speaking um the uh, Steve, uh, Senator Steve Gooch had put out a survey on uh, suggesting that the school calendar, calendar be modified to start after Labor Day and end before uh, Memorial Day, which would be May 31st. So we wanted to have a discussion possibly about having a resolution from our board and what we feel like is uh, not a good idea. And. I don't know if you all have heard any comments. I went to West LSE meeting this morning and kind of casually mentioned this. And they, one of the teachers said testing would be a very big problem at the end of the year in high school because their end of the year course, their AP college, um, all these other tests that they have to take, and those schedules are not altered. So the time that you would be spending reviewing for tests would be um, limited because you would be ending the school year later and it would be very difficult for the students and the teachers to be able to get all that done. Uh, the other thing uh, which was interesting was a, a mother was had moved here from Houston and at first uh, did not like the fact that we had the fall break, didn't see any sense in it because they certainly didn't do that in Houston. But what she noticed was that her students were not as stressed, they were not getting sick, mm -hmm and uh, at all because they had that break away from this, the mm -hmm. clouds. So it, she felt like she was all for it now, thought it was a very good idea that we had the, the calendar that was spread out a little bit more. Well, so I, I think one of the misconceptions is, I know some things I read, it said that you could just add 15 minutes to the day and nothing else would change. And I, I think that people think that, that we would still have fall break and we would still have at Christmas, and we, and that's not that's not true, correct? Well, the state has a minimum number of required instructional hours. Now, it is up to local school systems to determine how you build your calendar. However, I, I took the proposal, and and you're right. It, between Martin Luther King Day and if school got out before Memorial Day, there would be no student holidays Good between all. those two periods of time. And so I think that that creates um, a conversation that we need to have if we're seriously looking at a calendar like this. The other thing um, I think we have to keep in mind, back when a lot of us were in school, that's the way it was, Labor Day to Memorial Day. But schools were built based on an agrarian calendar back when we were very much an agricultural nation. That's changed. And because that's changed, schools have changed. Uh, you still have schools that start after Labor Day in some parts of the country, but typically they don't get out to the middle latter part of June. They're still going the same amount of time that we have. They still have those breaks throughout the school year because what we have learned by having those breaks is that students and teachers both need them. About six to seven weeks is about as long as you can go before you start to see two things happen. Teacher absenteeism goes up if you don't have those breaks in. And, and number two, classroom management issues increase as well because students and teachers both are getting a little bit tired. And so I have found over the years by having what we now call a balanced calendar, where we're not off as long in the summer, that you don't, you don't have those same issues you used to have. And the other big one is um, student academic regression. If you're off for three months in the summer, as we used to be, students who are disabled, students who are English language learners are going to take a major step back in those three months because they are without instruction. And you will spend more time at the beginning of the school year reteaching re foundational skills, not only academic, but also management skills. And all of that, you're losing instruction time. If you're spending time dealing with classroom management issues, if you're dealing with having more substitute teachers because teachers are out, 
and you're spending more time reteaching at the beginning of the year mm -hmm. because of a longer summer break, you're losing instructional okay. time. And I think all of those points need to be taken into consideration when we're talking about the potential change of a school calendar. And the other one that I don't think we need to lose sight of, we're talking about local control. Our community is very involved in the creation of our calendar. We take <coughs> lots of feedback and have made changes over the year based on what we've heard from our community. And I know when Mr. Perkle gets feedback, about 80 to 85 percent the vast majority of our community likes our calendar the way it is now. And I think calendars need to be built based upon feedback we get from our community and not, in my opinion, not really a state decision. I know when I came on the board eight or ten years ago, the calendar was a huge issue and it mm -hmm. was very controversial mm -hmm. and it was not so, but the last few years I think that the I Joey, they've mm -hmm. he's taken all the feedback mm -hmm. and created a calendar that I mean, you have some people that don't like You're it. Always it. Never it. Right. But I'm right. with you. I think the majority of our, our students and parents and teachers. And the results show it. Yes. Also, in, well, in our, our uh, legislative priorities is teacher retention. Mm -hmm. And if it gets to the situation where it's more difficult for them to teach, is that going to be more difficult for us mm -hmm. to, to get and retain mm -hmm. the teachers? Mm -hmm. It just seems like a step backwards. Mm -hmm. I well, these are the same arguments I had on committees years and years ago here in Versailles when we talked about year-round school. Mm -hmm. uh, the agrarian calendar came up, and we talked about how that changed things. And I'm like, we got to let that go. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, some counties still have an agrarian issue, and mm -hmm. they need to take their actions for their students but to have and from what I can tell uh, it might be the Chamber of Commerce driving it trying to use student labor right to That's get exactly to increase you know tourism and I'm like but tourism's the reason people like to have it off here so we're saying take away from our tourism to other places maybe mm -hmm. to grow that uh, income base, and that's really what it boils down to is money. And to so your point, that's just saying every county is different. Every county yes, is very so different. Right. Exactly. And what that's their needs story. are, whether you have a six flags in your count county and you need that kind of a labor right. to run that business, you can do that's it. a different thing. And you can talk about that as a county and make that decision, but don't impose it upon us who may not have that need. Right. I so actually did some research, and there's actually the district option, like we have now 38 states actually have the option of deciding on their own calendars. Mm -hmm. I think through this misconception that we've heard and seen through the Facebook and the everything, everybody thinks, oh, there's a lot of states out there that start after Labor Day. There's three. Michigan, what? Virginia, and Minnesota. And this year, Minnesota started on the 27th of August because they got a waiver. Uh, Michigan started on August 15th because they got a waiver because they're finding that they need to start earlier to get in the instructional time. I'm from Minnesota and my brother's a superintendent, so he said that. He says, we can get a waiver, but they want us to start after Labor Day. So there's only three states that start after Labor Day. <coughs> and when so did they, they, when, when <laughs> they end? Uh, they end in, a lot of them go into June. Uh, they go into, yeah, June 10th, and the one goes, the one is actually done. Michigan is, Michigan City was actually done by, by Memorial Day. But again, less breaks. They don't think, but I, I argued this back in 2005 in front of the legislature, and we mm -hmm. went down there, mm -hmm. and we went through, and we start. I just said, okay, people need to, they need to look at this calendar. And I said, okay, you, if you're going to do this, okay, we've got 15 days that we can, there, this is, there's this many days between Labor Day and Memorial Day, and so we've got 15 days we can work with. Well, by the time we got to Christmas, I said, okay, you can only have about five days at Christmas. And it was like, oh, we're, we're great. We have 12 days scheduled, because you have to do, you know, you'd have to do certain days off yeah, um, just to get in Thanksgiving and Christmas. And after that, and I said, we're on black scheduling back then. You needed two days of professional de development. I said, great, we've got 12 days already planned. We only have three, we only have three days left. And I said, I cannot go back to my community and say, okay, no more spring break, because we only have three days. I mean, that's putting in no fall break, no anything. So I fought for it long and hard because another thing to me is with our county growing and having the opportunity to, d to have dual enrollment with the, with the colleges, mm -hmm. they're on that schedule. By the semester's up by Christmas and you're dealing with all these students that have their high school career is at, are at, at the colleges. The and all of a sudden you're putting a, you're putting a re big old that's cog right. in that wheel that says, well, that's not going to work out. You know, if you want to go to college, that's fine, but you're going to be a totally different schedule that's than you are 
with your high school classes. So, and to me, I see our community getting even more and more, more online, more dual mm -hmm. enrollment, the state right. things the like state that. Wants, right? They're pushing that. So I think it's very, very Good few point. across the country. Like I say, 38 states, it's the district's option. And I think we're trying to we're fight for fighting for more, like say, local control and flexibility to so to now to impose on us and tell us that this is the right thing from the state level to do. I just don't think that's the right thing. Sorry. But I think there's so much misconception out there. Parents like Joey will tell you with the calendar, yeah, I want to start late and I want to end early, but I want all my breaks. And you yeah. just can't have it all. It just yeah. doesn't work out well, that you way. You just go ahead and do you know, nice, right? Yeah. You just can't well, have everything. For our calendar, it's been about the same for the last at least three, right. four, roughly the same since mm -hmm. we instituted the fall break. So. Like, like exactly. Darla said, we've been fine tuning and fine tuning it. Mm -hmm. At least four or five. Yeah, so it's, we got it. We got a well like machine. It's a good thing. I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the results show it. So, mm -hmm. so if everybody's in agreement, we'll oh, yeah. come up with a resolution. Yeah, I'll be happy to draft something okay. mm -hmm. for you to look at for next week. And I guess the, the, the final comment I would make you know, every decision we make around education should be guided by what's in the best interest like of, of our students mm -hmm. and and I think that's the conversation we're having mm -hmm. right now is I think we've built a calendar in Forsyth County that we believe best serves mm -hmm. our students and I think that should be the guiding principle in any of right. these conversations with right. the approval of 85 percent of our population yeah so yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and you know that's a rough number I, I, you know but it, no question the vast majority of our citizens uh, are in favor of our calendar because we hear Correct. from them in force. Mm -hmm. So I'll be happy to put something together and bring it to you next right, week. Yes. Right. Please. Uh, any suggestion for future agenda items? Yes. I've got one. I last last night I went and Cindy did a wonderful job with our, the com the suicide conference. It was um, <coughs> so well done. And part of it was listening to all the things that are going on in our school system, not only the Whisper program at Lambert, yes. but the other foundation, and I can't, is it LDJ or something, um, is, was started in Pennsylvania by a, a, some sisters whose brother had committed suicide, and they, they teach mental health uh, um, curriculum. They've developed this on the foundation, and it started at West, and it's at Denmark now. Um, but the, the highlight was the report that was given by Katie, Kathy? Katie. Katie. Katie uh, on how she has um, developed a coalition of all of the services in the county that can support our mental health initiatives in our school system. And I would love for her to come and mm -hmm. give it to us as a board. It was, mm -hmm. it just blew my mind away. I didn't know that we had all this, oh, that well, she had worked so hard. She really started that, putting the, that committee together last year, right, Debbie? And it's really, yeah. you know, really coming together nicely yeah. now. And I know Katie would not have a problem coming back yeah, sometime this fall and giving you guys an yeah, overview. Mm -hmm. She has done a really good job facilitating that. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of key partners at the table having mm -hmm. this very important conversation. Mm -hmm. So we'll make that happen. Good. That was very good. Okay. At this time, with Todd Shirley with an action item on the SRO agreement, please. Well, Mr. Shirley. Speaking of what you do as well with all our mental health and all our kids. Oh, uh, uh, just one day at a time in our office. Mm -hmm. It's not on here. Uh, oh, you do have a copy of everything? Okay, yeah, I, I was just really um, here to talk about that just for a minute or really more so to answer any questions that you might have. I, we had one last minute change last week we pulled a page and put another page in and it was an agreement that um, Dr. Bearden and um, <coughs> Sheriff Freeman and I sat down and talked about when we would pay them and it was it was okay with us a couple of times a year and we had been doing that in the past but we just modified that a little bit to assist them in um, really the purchasing of new vehicles for those SROs. Mm -hmm. um, so we changed that one page. Uh, as always, we're still committed to the SROs on every campus. We are committed to working to have two SROs in every school. And then the- and Every high school. Every high school, excuse me, yes, every, every, every high school. And then in there is also a part of the uh, ATS agreement, which we continue to move forward with. Um, it's still a little bit slow. I know there were some things that changed this summer and then um, there were um, there was a little bit of confusion about 
when you can pass a bus with the stop arms out, but hopefully we're getting the word out there, and uh, we'll you know we'll see uh, we'll see that part moving forward as well. Uh, so we are starting to see some numbers roll in from that. But if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer those questions if I if I can. Yeah, I just wanted to put it out there tonight. The commissioners are actually voting on this contract, I believe, this afternoon or evening, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to make sure you, it, nothing has changed. This is all information that Todd has shared with you throughout this process as we have, uh, you know, invested more money into our school resource officer program uh, with the contract with ATS and how those revenues will be divided. So basically everything we've heard in the past is now in writing. And so if you don't have any questions, I would just recommend approval of the agreement with the uh, Forsyth County Sheriff's Office. Is there a motion to approve you? So uh, moved. Second. Motion by Tom and second from Kristen. Any com comments? Just Glad to see this continuing partnership with the Sheriff's Department. This uh, continues to grow. It's, great. it's been fantastic in the recent SROs that we have hired. The feedback is phenomenal on them. We just don't ever want to lose one right now because right. they're so yeah. good. Right. So they have a couple in training right now that are okay. close to getting a couple in certified and ready to go. Great. Awesome. Right. Thank, All right. you Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All in favor? You know, it's Okay, a motion to go in executive session for a uh, land issue. So moved. Second. Motion from Tom, a second from Nancy. All in favor? 